room or online uh, through chi.cnf.io. I would also like to thank our partner organization, Eye on India, for their support and assistance in developing this program. It would not have been possible without them. Finally, before I turn it over to our panelists, a few brief words about them, although you have their bios on the slides, on the screens and, um, on either side of me. Alyssa Ayers is Senior Fellow for India, Pakistan, and South Asia at the Council on Foreign Relations, and she is the author of Our Time Has Come, How India is Making Its Place in the Modern World, which will be available for sale and signing after the program. Raghuram Rajan is Catherine Dusak Miller, Distinguished Professor of Finance at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business, and he was previously the Governor of the Reserve Bank of India. Somini Sengupta is a foreign correspondent at the New York Times and the author of The End of Karma, Hope and Fury Among India's Young, which will also be available for purchase and signing after the program. Tunku Varadarajan is Virginia Hobbs Carpenter Fellow in Journalism at Stanford's Hoover Institution and also a contributing editor at Political Magazine and previously an editor at the Wall Street Journal. Finally, our panel will be moderated by Marshall Bhutan, who is Senior Fellow at the University of Pennsylvania Center for Advanced Study of India and, of course, President Emeritus of the Shah Council on Global Affairs. I'll return to moderate Q&A, but for now, please join me in welcoming our uh, esteemed panel. Thank you, Amelia. Um, I, I want to first um, say how wonderful it is to be back in Chicago, always, no matter what the level of the snow on the streets. Um, um, I want to thank the, the council for organizing this event. Um, Neve King and I first talked about it last summer, and I know it's uh, taken a while to pull this superb panel together, but it was worth the wait. Um, <clears throat> our task tonight is to attempt in the short space of about 40 minutes, before we turn to your questions, I might add, um, assess India's progress uh, over the last seven decades, and equally importantly, to kind of look ahead at what is in store for India in the, in the decades to come. Um, much, of course, has changed, and much for the better in India, but it still faces daunting tasks, daunting challenges, both at home and abroad. Uh, just the recent headlines uh, will demonstrate that, both the, the potential and the, some of the perils that India faces. Uh, in the last few years, India on at least two, uh, in at least two of those years, was the fastest growing major economy in the world. At the same time, India has the largest absolute number of poor people within national boundaries in the world, and of course faces huge tasks of, of generating employment for its burgeoning youth population. India's democracy, uh, well-established, functioning for stability and mobility in Indian society uh, is, is well-established, but constantly being asked to deal with such a wide range of problems and, and diverse issues issues. Um, India, once uh, committed as, as it was to democracy to a secular liberal society, that identity is increasingly being questioned uh, by those who would prefer an Indian identity uh, more centered on uh, Hinduism. India's state, once described as soft, is increasingly embracing assertive nationalism, hardening its responses to national security threats, and seeking wider recognition for its rise as a global power. So these are but some of the current manifestations of both India's opportunities and challenges, and we hope to cover a number of these as well as others in the short space of our time today. Here's how we're going to proceed. I'm going to start with a totally unfair question I'm going to impose to all my distinguished colleagues um, and ask them equally unfairly for an up or down binary response, yes or no, to the question. They, they obviously will dodge that, I suspect. <laughs> but, it, but at a minimum, to give us a couple of minutes of explanation for their, for their posi position, whatever that may be. Um, then uh, I will turn and ask each of them uh, a more in-depth question about issues of particular interest and particular expertise to 
to them, and uh, they will respond in turn for you know five or six minutes each. Then I hope we'll have a little bit of time for discussion among this extre extremely um, well-informed panel, uh, and then back and over to you for the final the final questions. So. Let me start um, with uh, that opening question. Um, in the introduction to Alyssa's uh, excellent new book, uh, Our Time Has Come, on India's Place in the World, she quotes at length from an interview she had with uh, a prominent Indian journalist by the name of Arnab Goswami. Uh, Goswami, who is reputed to be tapping into India's middle class, class impatience, uh, told Alyssa in that interview, and I'm paraphrasing for the most part here, uh, that Indians want in the next 20 years to see their nation among the top five nations in the world, on a par with China militarily and economically, but with stronger and more resilient political institutions than China's. So with that description as background, I want to ask each of our colleagues to respond to whether they think India will, in fact, be one of the top four or five nations in the world by, let's say, 2040, um, and why they think what they think about that, that important question. So let me start with Somini. 2040 will be nearly 100 years since um, India's independence. And I would answer your question by saying it can only if it begins to guarantee half of its population, women and girls, something like basic civil liberties. I think gender has become increasingly a flashpoint, and it will become an even more important flashpoint um, as this generation, um, uh, who I write about in the book, as they come of age and take power. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Dunkel? Uh, yes and no. Uh, <laughs> I uh, Marshall said so. we could dodge. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, Arnab, the only thing Arnab Goswami taps into is, is his own ego, not <laughs> middle class aspirations. I see, yes. yes. Uh, can you hear me now? Oh, okay. Thank you. I, I, I'm very soft spoken, I'm afraid. Um, I think, y yes, of course, India will be a power in 20 years from now. Um, it'll have the world's uh, largest population, the world's third large, largest army, the fourth or fifth largest economy, um, the largest middle class, you know, however hokily you define it, uh, the best cricket team. I mean, there, there's every, every, every... I should note that, uh, that among his many areas of expertise, Tunku is a world-renowned expert on cricket, for those of you in the audience who are cricketers. So by, by any fair or rational calculus, it would be hard to deny India's power status 20 years from now. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost there anyway. Uh, but will it, in a formal sense, become a world power in the way that the structures and architecture of international relations defines it? Will, will it, for instance, become a permanent member of the UN Security Council? I'm not so sure about that. Uh, let's, not, uh, let's not underestimate the Chinese desire to block India's entry there, the British and French resistance to any dilution of their rapidly diluting power, uh, Russia's kind of galloping sense of insecurity with India. You know, where do we, Russia doesn't know where it stands with India presently. Uh, and the American sense that India on the Security Council won't give America what it wants necessarily. So, yes, India by, by a sort of moral and rational calculus will be a par, but will it be a par in, an, in a formal institutional sense? I'm not so sure. Okay, thank you. Alyssa? Since you've written a book on this topic. But the, uh, no, thank you for posing it based on uh, the, the, that interview in the book, which I thought was quite revealing. I, you know, what? to me, I think the answer is largely yes. I think that India is heading in a direction where we can see it becoming one of the world's fifth largest economies this year, potentially. Uh, as Tunku said, it does have the third largest military and personnel strength. It is already the world's fifth or sixth largest defense budget, depending on how you measure that. Um, 
the question of India's ability to access these institutions of global governance is a separable question, and for me that's an important question for U.S. foreign policy and how Washington should be thinking about what we as Americans and as supporters of a strong strategic partnership with India and with a declared U.S. foreign policy to support India's rise on the world stage. This has been uh, a component of U.S. foreign policy from the George W. Bush administration forward. I I think we should be helping India to gain access to membership in institutions where it does not presently have that, uh, and that should be something that we, we focus on as a, a very active part of U.S. policy. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy. I think when you, uh, Tunku referred to U.N. Security Council reform, there's a reason that reform has dragged on for years and years and not budged really one inch. It's because some people will lose. And it's very difficult to get 190 some countries to agree on the shape of a sort of Security Council expansion and what that would look like. But is it fair to exclude a country that has such a large population that is a major contributor to global peacekeeping under the UN uh, umbrella that uh, has played a role maintaining democracy for more than 70 years? I mean, to me, that answer is India, yes, is a power, will be a more prominent power in 20 years, but the institutional question is something that we, as Americans, should take on and put our shoulder to the wheel to help achieve. Thank you. Raghu. So uh, if the question is simply about the size of the economy, mm -hmm. unless there are accidents, almost surely it will be the third largest. I mean, just um, take 7% for 20 years. That takes you to four times the current size, which is 2.5 trillion. So we get to 10 trillion. The uh, real question uh, is, first, are there going to be accidents, and would those accidents knock us off? I think so many talked about one possible source of accident. You talked about another religion. And these could have uh, enormous effects and, and could upset this normal pace of growth. Uh, there could also be positive accidents where we grow faster than, than seven and get to nine or ten. Um, democracy puts some constraints on how fast you can grow, but also make sure that growth is sustainable. So hopefully we will get there. The real question is, what do we want to do when we are the third biggest country in the world? Do we, you know, uh, I would think the message we would have for many of the poorer countries in the world, if we are successful, is that we got here with democracy. We got here with a more equal distribution of, uh, of both capabilities, uh, as well as uh, as wealth, and that this is a sustainable path for growth. Now, no. Uh, by the way, you said you know largest. Uh, what is the fastest growing large economy? We're also the poorest large economy. Mm -hmm. So the two go together. It's not uh, necessarily a vindication of our capabilities, but we have capabilities. And the question is, can we send a message after 20 years to many of the uh, you know, poorer countries in the world, some in our region, some in, uh, in Africa, that there is a path for growth which is sustainable, which doesn't require bulldozing over uh, people's livelihoods, and that uh, India shows a way. Thank you. Well, there's several things that have come up here that I want to try to hope to return to before we, before we run out of time. Um, but Raghu, if I can ask you to, to continue. Could you address the question of job growth? Um, I mentioned this in my introductory remarks. Um, every year, 10 to 12 million young Indians enter the, the labor force. Uh, that's projected to continue over the next 15 years or so. Um, so huge job growth is needed. Um, Prime Minister Modi, Modi, when he was campaigning for office back in 2014, promised 10 million jobs annually. Um, the actual result over four, the last four years has been very far short of that. Where are these jobs going to come from? How can they be created? Um, what are the policies that are going to be required? So very quickly, first start with why there is pessimism about job growth, right? First, a lot of people say India's missed the manufacturing bus that every East Asian country took on the way to strong growth. And therefore, without manufacturing, where are jobs going to come from? Uh, that's the big question. And then the second uh, question is, is really exports. Uh, I mean, the two go together for the most part, but exports are going to become much more difficult in this climate of protectionism, 
plus also insourcing as countries pull back jobs uh, because they've mechanized manufacturing and they can customize much more easily with robots and all that stuff. So uh, there's both a technological component, there's a political component for all this pessimism. My sense is that many countries gr can grow for a long time, especially large countries, just on doing the basic stuff, building out infrastructure, for example, construction. The number of jobs that construction accounts for in China. Uh, I mean, India could, could, could go a fair amount just by building that stuff out and then seeing the job growth along the highways that are built at the ports, at, uh, at the railway stations and so on uh, from this kind of activity. So direct jobs in construction plus ancillary jobs as you make it easier to access places. For example, when a road is built into a village, you suddenly see an enormous expansion in activity there. Now they can have poultry farms, which actually can send eggs to the cities because there's now connectivity mm -hmm. through the roads. Uh, you have shops opening up. So this kind of activity can go on for some time. Remember, India starts out very poor. Now, are there places where we will export? Of course. Our manufacturing actually can improve quite a bit once it has access to logistics. But clearly, we also have to do a fair amount in upgrading the quality of our workforce, mm -hmm. which means much better schools, uh, focusing on quality rather than just quantity. Mm -hmm. At this point, we, we focused mm -hmm. on quantity. Now we need quality. But not just schools, institutions of higher education. Uh, I mean, these are, uh, we need to do all this work. But I would say start first with the infrastructure. Make sure it gets built out. One of the big disappointments about the Modi government Lots of successes, uh, you know, the GST, bankruptcy code, and so on. But the big disappointment is this was a government which came in on the strength of implementation. We will get all those projects which are stuck up and running. We have these massive ideas for projects mm -hmm. such as the East-West Corridor, the Delhi-Mumbai Industrial Corridor. Don't hear of any of that now. We need those, and we need to do them fast. And for that, I think we need to fix the bottlenecks. And uh, maybe it's the next government which does it. What are the bottlenecks? Land acquisition is the biggest constraint uh, in building out infrastructure. Uh, well, everybody knows that property rights in India are poorly defined. Uh, so everybody wants the government to acquire. But as soon as the government starts the process of acquisition, entrepreneurial pro politicians uh, uh, you know, see there's hay to make, and they start opposing this process. So uh, we need a fair system of land acquisition. Some states have uh, sort of uh, uh, found these ways. For example, uh, Andhra Pradesh uh, has a capital city which is built on land which is acquired from farmers, enormous amounts of land, but based on a sharing formula. You give us five acres, we give you back two acres which are developed and which you can then use as a means of livelihood. Mm -hmm. So we need to find these ways. We are stuck with a Central Land Acquisition Act, which is not workable. But for fear of being accused of being the, on the side of the rich, this government hasn't moved to change that. In my sense, that would be task one. Excellent. OK, can, can I turn now to, to Somani, um, back on the subject of India's youth. 50% um, of India's population today is under the age of 25. Um, and according to a recent survey uh, of Indian young people aged 15 to 34, um, yes, indeed, as you would expect, 50% of them are deeply anxious about their livelihoods uh, presently and into the future. But what's interesting, it struck me on first glance, is that uh, an almost equal number of them are very socially conservative and uninterested in politics. Uh, only 50% or so were sort of declared an affiliation of support for a, a major a na national party. Um, most of the rest were distinctly, seemed to be distinctly uninterested. Now, this is, of course, just one survey. And then there's the question about how they will sort out on these issues of religious identity and, and uh, liberal values in Indian society. I'd love for you to talk to us about what you see happening in youth and how they will shape the nation's stability and development in the years ahead. Yeah, thanks for that question. India has more young people today than any other country in recorded human history. Uh, one million Indians turn 18 every month. Um, not just this year, but for the next 
uh, roughly 13 to 15 years, as Marshall said. Um, that means every month they go out um, into the workforce, uh, they register to vote, they embrace the internet for the first time, many of them, they fall in love, they speak out, they um, shape the future of India's democracy. So it's an incredibly important generation. And in my book, I call them um, high noons children. High noon because um, it's in contrast to my father's generation, my parents' generation. They're known as midnight's children. They came of age um, after midnight, August 15th, 1947, India's independence. Um, and this generation, um, I see as incredibly hungry, as incredibly impatient, um, incredibly ambitious. All of that is a great thing. It's a great, fantastic asset. But it comes against the backdrop of um, years of failure to invest in education and health in particular. Um, for the first time, you have um, almost universal enrollment in primary schools in India. So almost every child is going to school, but the quality of education is um, uh, quite alarming. In surveys year after year, um, it turns out that most uh, children who are in fifth grade cannot read a basic textbook. They are functionally illiterate, cannot do basic arithmetic. Um, healthcare, public health remains um, uh, very, very worrying. Uh, just one data point, two thirds of Indian women are anemic. Um, you know, that's an astonishing number for, uh, for a country of such incredible economic potential um, and, and growth. Um, so, uh, so that's one, and I think Marshall, you already pointed to the unenviable challenge of creating so many jobs for uh, an, uh, an ambitious, aspirational population, particularly in the age of automation, right? No other country faces the scale of India's job creation challenge. Um, secondly, that economic challenge is against the backdrop of climate change. Most Indians live um, in places where there's too much water or too little water. So they are threatened by sea rise all along the coast. Um, they're threatened by drought in the countryside. That is an enormous challenge. Um, related to that, of course, is um, you know, India's promise and burning need to cut down its own emissions. Not just because of the Paris Agreement, but just because of the demands of its populations um, uh, for cleaner air and, and so on. As for your excellent point about the conservatism of young Indians, it does sometimes seem like a paradox, I think, for, for those of us in the West. Um, but young Indians are not um, necessarily uh, em they are not necessarily um, embracing um, a liberal constitutional democracy. Um, I think that is up for grabs. Um, will they defend India's constitutional liberal democratic order, or will they embrace autocracy um, and growing authoritarianism? Um, I think the jury's out on that. Um, there was a very interesting survey done by Pew late last year, which found that yes, a majority of Indians like their democratic system, but uh, over 50% also favored um, an autocratic system. Over 50% um, thought that military rule would be okay. Um, that was not just among young people surveyed, but across um, the, the population. So I think that's really uh, a very, very important question. Also, when we think about India's rise in the world and what kind of a power um, it can aspire to be, will it represent um, a champion of liberal democratic values, um, or will it represent something else? Um, 
And we don't yet know that. Given its voting record um, at the United Nations, given its long record of ab abstentions on a whole variety of things we could talk about later, we don't actually know what kind of a power, what kind of world power India will represent. Thank you very much. Alyssa, you want to pick up on that last point, and, but more broadly, I'd like to yeah. ask you about, um, for those of you who haven't read Alyssa's book, it's superb. Um, but you spend a lot of time addressing the very important questions of the ways in which India's domestic challenges could impede its aspiration to being one of the top five nations or a, a global actor, I mean, pick, your, pick your term. Um, the part that I find hardest personally to, to buy into is, going back to Raghu's points, is the dealing with the, with the, achieving the economic growth and the economic growth with, with a degree of equity and stability uh, in the society that's going to enable India to, to achieve that, those goals. And I wanted to cite in particular the recently released the Government of India budget came out just uh, 10 days ago for 2018. And in that budget, there are huge new outlays for agriculture, where there is, because there's genuinely an ag agrarian crisis in India today, uh, the worst perhaps of a different sort, but uh, the worst perhaps since the 1960s, which led to the Green Revolution. Um, huge new outlays, a, a, a vauntingly ambitious plan to, to expend lots of money on a health, health for every Indian, basically, and other welfare schemes. But spending on defense, as a percentage flat. of GDP, actually flat or just yeah. down a little bit. 1.6% yeah. um, of GDP compared to over 2% of GDP, by most estimates, for China, out of a much larger GDP. So these are hard choices that a democratically elected government is going to have to make. And I, I'm it's still not computing for me how that's going to happen in a sustained way over the next 20 years. I'd love to have you talk more about that. Well, I can try to apply my mind to this question. I cannot predict exactly what's going to happen over the course of the next 20 years. I mean, I think uh, if we look at the trajectory that India has been on, it's been a little bit of a bumpy ride. India's had some strong years of economic growth. It's had some moments of, uh, in fact, you started your role in the RBI just as India's rupee was in free fall. I mean, I think it's hard sometimes for people to remember what the summer of 2013 was like. Um, if we look at where the Indian economy could go on a sustained basis, the likelihood is that it will continue to grow perhaps around 7%, perhaps around 7.5%. It may not. Uh, if it cannot do that, the question you've posed comes to the fore. Will India then be able to uh, expend the enormous outlays that it needs to build one of the world's strongest militaries. It is already, again, as I mentioned at the outset, either the fifth or the sixth largest defense budget. Uh, it will likely remain in that position with this static budget uh, for this upcoming fiscal year. It hasn't increased. It's, it's basically flat. Um, the question then is, what is India choosing to do with its defense modernization? What is it choosing to pick up as areas of operation that it's new and different from the past? If we're speaking only about the military, um, I think that one of the most intriguing and interesting uh, points that indicate India's direction for the coming years are its declaration of uh, an ambition for primacy across the Indian Ocean. It has been doubling down on modernizing its navy in order to achieve that ambition. There was a government decision in 2012 to increase its number of naval vessels from 138 to 198, that it becomes a serious navy if it gets to that size. Uh, India has worked very hard internationally to build its relationships, particularly in the naval space with the United States, with Japan. Uh, Japan actually in 2015 became a permanent member of an annual naval exercise that the United States and India have been maintaining for some years. This is actually quite a show of force to see India, the United States, and Japan all together in the Indian Ocean. 
India is now routinely referred to as a net provider of regional security for this larger region, uh, not by you know, ordinary people, but by US secretaries of defense. Uh, that's the type of performance that we're now seeing from India on the defense side. Um, in 2015, India rescued uh, more than 1,000 foreign nationals after Yemen collapsed. In fact, the United States had uh, a note on the U.S. Embassy's website, the, the United States Embassy had closed, saying for people who are in an emergency, please contact the Indian Embassy for assistance. So that really is quite something. I think that represents quite a dramatic shift from where India was on these questions perhaps 15, 20 years ago. It is playing a more forward-leaning role. It is more active in the military space. You are absolutely correct to say that if it cannot maintain high levels of growth to be able to support uh, a, a, an ongoing level of military modernization through significant outlays, that becomes challenging. But what we have seen so far suggests that the path is towards that uh, more capable partner, uh, particularly in the maritime space. Thank you. Tunku, I want to return to the subject of the social, India's social dynamics, socio-cultural dynamics, and their implications for politics. Um, um, we, we spoke earlier about the challenges being posed to India's secular ideal, uh, the, the ideal that Nehru embraced of a composite culture in which all, all those cultures, all those communities are equally respected and uh, treated under the Indian constitution. Um, and we find a, a, a much greater assertion of, of the importance of Hinduness, whichever that, whatever that, that means. At the same time, this, this accusation of uh, increasingly illiberal attitudes, especially concerns about free speech um, uh, under, under the present government. Um, uh, could you share with us, I know you've been traveling widely recently in India, and of course, based on your excellent writings on Indians, India's uh, political culture, I'd love to hear you talk about where you think India is now and where is it going. How worried are you that that secular liberal ideal will, will fade from view? Uh, thanks, thanks, Marshall. It's a tough question. Um, it, India is currently in the process of uh, remaking itself. Uh, it's undoing what was essentially and what, what might uh, glibly but still accurately be described as the Nehruvian legacy, the legacy of its first prime minister, Jawaharlal Nehru. Uh, one, uh, so there were two parts to Nehru's uh, program for India, his, his vision for India. One was uh, the part that, was, that started to be dismantled in 1991, which was his sense that India was uh, best served by being self-reliant, self-sufficient, uh, the, so India had a sort of autarkic daydream until about 1991, when it sort of woke up with a jolt and realized that it was broke. Um, and it began to, to remake it. It had what was, in effect, a sort of Deng Xiaoping moment in 1991, 13 years after China had its Deng Xiaoping moment. And you can see that lag in, in any comparison between the two countries today. Um, so it undid or began to undo the Nehruvian economic uh, state-regulated legacy in 1991 under a Congress government, let it be known. Um, but un being undone also is the other aspect of the Nehruvian legacy, which was, is that of secular liberalism, political liberalism, secular constitutionality. Um, that has started to come under attack uh, in recent times, uh, most particularly since 2014, uh, when Mr. Modi became Prime Minister. Uh, his is not the first BJP government, but previous BJP governments have not had quite such a sort of, ha haven't tackled uh, Indian constitutional liberalism in quite such a head-on way as this one appears to be doing, not just the government, but its fellow travelers. Um, and so there's a great danger that the sort of Nehruvian baby is in danger of being thrown out along with the Nehruvian Bathwater, uh, the baby being the nice bits, uh, the the sort of the the, <laughs> the, the 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 secular the secular tolerant liberal constitutional bits. Um, now, the, this is where I'd like to tie this. If I've got a few a couple more minutes to to something that to, to some of the things that Sony talked about, uh, you know, where 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 are India's where are youth going to take India in all of this? Um, because India's future, its politics is going to be shaped by its voters, and its voters are overwhelmingly young. 
and as you pointed out, in that survey from, by the Center for the Study of Developing Societies, um, you know, 48% uh, of them profess to be, uh, uh, profess to have allegation, uh, allegiances to no party in particular. 52% do, but 20% are BJP, 10% Congress, and it, there's a sort of archipelagic kind of fracturing of where allegiances lie, but 48% say we're not party members, we're not affiliated to anyone. So this 48% is going to be up for grabs. Um, and uh, Nehru, uh, Modi talks about the demographic dividend by which he means the, the, the gift to the world that India's youth is going to bring. Uh, and if handled well, yes, this could well happen. But you know, there's a, there's a danger that the demographic dividend might turn into a sort of demagogic dividend, uh, where, uh, or a demographic nightmare, depending on which way you look at it, because uh, you have these um, essentially unaffiliated, uh, uh, this mass of unaffiliated young people, uh, 18 million of whom come onto the job market every month, uh, many of those 18 million uh, to, to remain on, on unemployed because the market cannot as yet provide for them. Um, so there's a danger that India is going to be a country peopled by angry young voters with no jobs uh, who are vulnerable to uh, you know, the promises, the rhetoric, the propaganda of, of, of essentially irresponsible politicians who want to make political hay with, 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 with these vulnerable and impressionable resources. So, you know, you, this, the survey points out that, you know, I'm not, I'm not optimistic. Um, of the 15 to 34 year cohort in India, 60% uh, say that they would ban films that hurt religious sentiments. 69% uh, uh, of them, 69% uh, of Hindus in this group object to the consumption of beef. Um, 41 say that it's not okay for a woman to marry after marriage, to work after marriage. 38% um, believe girls shouldn't wear jeans. So we're, we're, you know, we're talking about a kind of socially and in some ways deeply religiously conservative group of people who could so easily turn on and against the secular framework that has uh, really kept India a politically coherent to the state. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, just want to take a couple minutes um, to pick up on this theme of the combination of two things, the institutions, Ruggle, you spoke about the, the capabilities, you spoke in particular about the difficulties in implementing infrastructure projects. You spoke also about the importance of education. Both are, could be, could be attributed to f institutional failures in India. And I have, it's a broader concern I have about about India's ability to create the kinds of, of uh, effective, reasonably, you know, not fully protected from political interference, but reasonably professional institutions that can accomplish a lot of the things that the, that the four of you have been talking about over the next 20 years. Um, and I, I wonder if you could, if you each of you could just briefly Tell me whether, whether you think that is a legitimate issue. That's one part. The second part is whether this same conservatism might actually be a hedge against instability in the case India fails to generate the economic growth, fails to create the jobs, fails to provide the infrastructure, and more importantly, fails to provide the better lives, the better living standards that so many Indians hope for today. So. Those are two giant questions. You can pick one of the two if you wish. It just, I'd love to quickly get a few thoughts on those things before we turn to the audience. Starting here? Yes, please. Well, um, on, on the institutional side, in, India can do it. Uh, needs to work on it. Um, we've got something like the Indian Space Research uh, mm -hmm. Organization, mm -hmm. which has, uh, you know, puts rockets into space at a fraction of the cost that is uh, they go into space in other places, has many solid engineers coming from second-tier universities, not the IITs, second-tier universities doing excellent work. Uh, and it's a great organization. Um, uh, and then there are politicized organizations, we know uh, a lot of them, uh, which, uh, um, you know, for example, a number of universities that don't actually teach uh, and uh, uh, impart very little to the students uh, of worth. So we have the range. The question is, how can we upgrade the institutions we have? Uh, the Supreme Court has moved through phases. 
it's uh, currently there's a big discussion going on uh, amongst the justices of the Supreme Court about uh, you know within uh, I guess the level of uh, of uh, autonomy the Supreme Court has and whether some of the cases are being handled uh, in a in a not uh, fully independent way. That said, the Supreme Court came out with an excellent judgment on uh, privacy the uh, the other um, a, a few months ago which I think will set the stage for a broader liberal India. Now, Tunku's point is, is, is right, uh, that there are very conservative uh, Indians. I presume this is across rural and urban areas. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and one of the big problems in India is as people come from the rural areas into the urban areas and see the kinds, you know, uh, women wearing jeans, for example, is something that they're starting to encounter in rural areas, but it is a big eye opener for some of them. And they Im immediately uh, conjecture that this means something about women's morals and, and their ability to take advantage of them and so on. That clash of civilizations, in some sense, mm -hmm. is going to be a big factor and one of the uh, important, uh, uh, I think, for the youth staying inside their villages. Uh, I think there are some constraints on the kind of uh, behavior that, uh, and, and, uh, but as they come into the cities and are on the fringes of the cities, uh, there is an issue of how uh, they can be controlled, uh, how they can be brought into the mainstream, and, and there the issue of jobs is, is very important. So uh, I think India is work in progress. And, and uh, it could go badly wrong if we don't provide, if we don't create these jobs. And if uh, you know, uh, there are lots of people moved out from agriculture because the the incomes are so low, but not finding anything in the cities and getting angry uh, day by day. On the other hand, if we can do enough, uh, I think there's a, a a process of adjustment by which over time they become more liberal as they come into contact with liberal society, uh, and as the village uh, still is a, a kind of uh, oasis uh, that they can go back to mm. if in case uh, the city doesn't work out. So we need both, uh, but we need more jobs here and we need more jobs there also. Uh, we need to strengthen agriculture. Mm -hmm. These are all things that, that have to be done. I think that, uh, I, I, I wouldn't lose hope that they can be done. Thank you. So May I just add yeah. um, one thing that you both referred to, and that was the subject of women wearing jeans. Um, it's a bit puzzling, I think, to a <laughs> lot of us here. But in my um, interviews with lots and lots of women and men, um, in small towns, in large cities, in the countryside, the issue, the image of women wearing jeans is a proxy. It's a metonym for women's freedom. It's about the ability of women to move around. Um, it is not about traditional clothing versus non-traditional clothing. And um, India is, it, it, the reason why this is important, important even for India's macroeconomic um, story is that women's economic, um, sorry, women's labor force participation is strikingly low in India and going down, even as women's education is increasing, even as economic opportunities are increasing, 27% of women participate in the formal labor force. That compares to 64% in China, um, slightly over 55% in the United States. It is anomalous. Um, it is a, a, a paradox. Um, between the years of 2004 and 2012, 19 million women dropped out of the labor force. They had jobs and they dropped out. Um, during that time, many more men joined the labor force. Um, so this conversation about jeans and whether women should or shouldn't wear jeans is really at the heart of that, is about whether women can be free, whether women can make their own money, whether they can make decisions in their lives. I'm going to add to this briefly for the two of you. Sure. Uh, um, I, yeah, I, I, of course, uh, uh, genes are really a sort of metaphor for emancipation. I think nobody would dispute that. Um, as are cell phones, you know, there are 
village councils in parts of North India where all male councils vote to prohibit women from having cell phones. So, and why? Not because they uh, don't want their women to talk on the phone. They don't want their women to to have a life, uh, you know, access to the world. Um, but I, I think India's the issue that India really faces and needs to grapple with is one of political management going forward. Uh, by that I mean uh, managing uh, expectations, because you this group of young people that we speak of, the demographic dividend cohort, has expectations like no generation in India before has had. Um, you know, they, 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 they have seen a better India. My, my nephews, who are the age now uh, that I was when I left India at 15, uh, have known an India that would have been another planet to me when I, was, when I was their age. You know, they've known only malls. They have sushi and pizza delivered to their home. They've <laughs> traveled abroad with their parents. When I was a boy, only the very rich, uh, the, uh, or people who worked for government, or people who emigrated went abroad. Um, so India's got to manage expectations. India has to manage also, along with those expectations, divisions. Uh, political divisions within the country, religious divisions, but in my view, um, uh, not enough talked about, but just as important, uh, divisions of inequality, regional inequality within the country. You have parts of India that have raced away in terms of development, the south, much of the south, and parts of India that really have, have, have seen development pass, uh, pass them by. Um, India's um, fertility rate is currently two points. I, the, the Indian woman has an average of 2.6 children in her lifetime. Uh, it's, it's going to drop with, with, with time, but there are parts of India where uh, the fertility rates are comparable with Denmark. And then there are parts of India where the fertility rate is incredi still incredibly high, 3.3, 3.6. And those happen to be the parts of India, UP and Bihar, where 50% uh, of women are illiterate, and 35% of men are illiterate. So, you know, you're going to see a, a crisis of unequal development in India that will have serious political ramifications if not managed. Lisa, you want to add anything here? Yeah, you know, we have left out talking about uh, India's private sector, and so many mentioned some things I would have said about women's labor force participation, but why don't I pivot and instead highlight what I think is an important part of the India story. This panel is titled India at 70. Yeah. Uh, and what? Quickly. Oh, quickly? Yeah, oh, so I don't get another five minutes? All right. Um, I, I do think that what we've seen in India emerge post-1991 and onward is some world-class companies that are creating jobs that are, you know, putting India on the map in a new and different way than would have been the case uh, prior to, you know, the 2000s. They are uh, creating an Indian imprint on the global workforce, on what it means to be an Indian business, and to the extent that that is also part of India's story of institutions. Uh, and, and forging a, a new kind of economy, I think we should also recognize that as well. Thank you. That's a good reminder to us all. Um, it's why reforms are so important and should continue. I mean, are you going to are you going to handle this? Uh, yeah. Okay, so we okay. have a few minutes left for questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and wait until I call on you. The mic will be sent over to you. Um, please keep your statements brief, your questions brief. Please make sure it's not a statement, um, because we want to get to as many as we can. And also a reminder, you can also submit them online. So could, could you also please, if you want, wish, direct your question to a particular person on the panel or to all of them or some sub subset of them so we can focus more quickly on responding? So we'll start right here in the front row. So Minning, <laughs> you said 19, women, 19 million women dropped out of the workforce. When was that? I didn't quite get the time. And what caused it? Uh, the time is easier to answer than what caused it. Um, the, the report that, I, um, that I'm referring to looked at the period between 2004-05, the fiscal year 2004-05, to 2011-12. So uh, just a little under you know, a, a decade. Why did women um, drop out um, is, a, is a tougher question. I think you would have to look at different segments of women, um, at what age group, whether it was um, uh, uh, women who moved because they got married or got married and 
decided to stop working or were not allowed to, to work, um, whether it was particular sectors where um, the hours were no longer sustainable for them um, because of a lack of childcare, you know, that, that is a sort of a, a harder one to, to tease out, but that is a very live question for social scientists is in a country where education is fast growing for women, um, uh, in a country where economic opportunities are growing, where there's incredible social mobility. You know, unlike China, Indians can move from one place to another um, with, with complete freedom. So, um, so it's, it's a question that I would like to see better answers to and more, more evidence-based answers to rather than conjecture. Raghu? Well, some of the uh, evidence that we have seen is uh, well, part of it is good news, uh, that these are net numbers, and so uh, women are staying longer in school rather than going out uh, into uh, to becoming part of the labor force. The second uh, issue is these are, this was a period of very strong growth in India, except for the last couple of years, uh, 10, 11, and 11, 12. But uh, uh, 2004, 5, 6, 7, enormous growth. And one uh, sort of... Uh, uh, fact is that a lot of women withdrew from agriculture and moved away. And the idea here is that in India, when families make enough money, uh, one of the things they try and do is withdraw women from, uh, it may be outside work, but it may also may be agricultural work. Now, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Bad thing if they wanted to work and were pulled back. Good thing if the, the, the uh, household thought it had enough income and didn't need them to do the work that was there outside the house. That we don't have enough information on. Was this against their will, or was it something that they acquiesced to because the, the, the family made enough money? It does reflect a male-oriented society where the man sort of is responsible for the income, and when there is enough income, pull, pull, pull the women out of the labor force. But we need to understand that much better. Great. Um, we have a question right there in the back. Hi, thank you all for being here. Uh, my question is for Mr. Rajan. Uh, I first became acquainted with you and your work after your appearance in Charles Ferguson's documentary about the financial crisis inside job. Um, so my question will be in that vein. Uh, my understanding is that India's banks, both its state-owned banks and some of its privately owned banks, are, are currently undergoing an exercise to clean up uh, bad debt after an extended period of various or very reckless lending, so reckless um, that it that could become a risk to growth. If that assessment is correct, um, what are your policy prescriptions for, for dealing with the bad debt and for, for avoiding this in the future? Um, first, I, I think that uh, um, you can call it reckless, you can call it euphoria, you can call it the world changed. It, it's part of everything, right? So, so there's a lot of lending in 2007, 8, 9, when India had done very well. And the expectation was it would continue doing well. And then everything slowed down. Uh, the world became a harder place to do business in. And a lot of projects went off track. There was also government failure, uh, lots of reasons. So uh, it's not, a lot of people think this is corruption. Corruption is just one part of it, there are lots of other reasons. Uh, what do we do about it? It's all, it already has affected growth, in my view. The public sector banks, where many of these bad loans are lodged, have slowed down their lending considerably since 2014. The, uh, what we have to do is clean up. And we, uh, India has been engaged in it for some time. I see hope. Uh, with the new bankruptcy code the government has, uh, has uh, put in place, uh, what that bankruptcy code does is finally give power to the creditors to actually force the borrowers to give their money back. Earlier, there was very little power the creditors had other than you know, constant nagging. Uh, but really, they didn't have anything they could impose on the, on the firm. Now, a number of firms are likely to be sold. And there is a clause which prevents the promoters, the entrepreneurs, from coming back and bidding for their firms at a cut rate price. This puts the fear of God in the entrepreneurs. If they default, they can lose their firms. Once that happens, they will come to the table to negotiate with the bankers when they, have, when they f uh, get into distress. It will help clean up the system very quickly. So the, uh, you know, the 9 uh, lakh crores worth of bad loans or 9 trillion rupees worth of bad loans uh, you know, can be resolved 
fairly, um, you know, I wouldn't say soon, but in a fairly clean way. And uh, you know, then the system can move ahead, but we need to do that. Thank you. We'll go right there in the middle. Uh, my question's for anybody who wants to take it. Uh, earlier this year, Prime Minister Modi um, took the step toward universal health care coverage for the entire population. Is this the type of bold initiative that could propel India into the ranks of the more advanced economies? And secondly, what are its chances of success? Who wants to take that? <laughs> this is only announced 10 yeah. days ago in the budget, so... Uh, there's no money in the budget set aside for it. You're right. <laughs> it's 2,000 crores. There's, there's no serious uh, health insurance program which will cost 2,000 crores. That's, that's about $300 million. Uh, the ambition is there. Uh, there are government schemes which do some of this in some states, but the idea is to cover every household up to something like $10,000, which will go a long way uh, for major operations. So I, I think if they can create a system which works, and you know more about healthcare than uh, I guess anybody else in this room, uh, but if they can create a system that works, uh, this will be a step forward. But before we focus on hospitalization and so on, India has to fix malnutrition. <laughs> That's the central sort of plague for kids and is condemning them to a second class existence for the rest of their lives. So we need a massive project to end malnutrition. Everything else is, is to my mind, lower priority than that. I would just add that uh, factoid that, uh, an important fact, not a factoid, that India has the highest rate of stunting of, of young children in the world, uh, sadly. Um, we'll take a question from online. So we've talked about Prime Minister Modi tonight, and there's a question um, asking, you know, Prime Minister Modi has bolstered uh, India's soft power significantly upon taking office. How do you think India is perceived abroad since taking office? So His perhaps, soft power, you yes. said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe, Alyssa, you could answer that because uh, your book talks about yeah, I, I think one of the things he's done has raised India's visibility around the world. He, uh, I think, to the surprise of many people, um, including myself, he became really a foreign policy prime minister. Uh, I don't think people expected that he would be so focused on foreign policy because it had really not been his emphasis in his earlier uh, tenure as chief minister of the state of Gujarat. Uh, he has spent a lot of political capital on... Uh, uh, bolstering India's role uh, internationally on calling for a greater role for India in some of the institutions we spoke about earlier, the UN Security Council, in seeking membership for India in the Asia-Pacific um, Economic Cooperation Forum. Um, he has continued uh, the process of working for Indian membership in the four major non-proliferation organizations. That is actually an outgrowth of what had been the U.S.-India Civil Nuclear Agreement, uh, which began under the previous Indian government and has continued forward. Um, the question of soft power is an interesting one. When I hear that, I normally think of soft power as the the you know, a pull of attraction and persuasion. Um, and th there is a component of what Prime Minister Modi has done that does indeed um, uh, amplify India's soft power. But it's also the case that India's soft power uh, is related to what's happening at home in India. And to the extent that India from time to time has some episodes of violence or stories that would shock any of us when we pick up and read them in the paper, whether it's issues of religious violence or caste problems or violence against women, which unfortunately still continues, that I think affects the way people think about India uh, and the type of country Country it is. So, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of different things going on with India's role on the world stage. The soft power component also does depend on what happens at home. Wonderful. Well, we have a lot more questions, but unfortunately, that is all the time we have. So, uh, please join me in thanking our panel. They will stay for a few minutes um, for the networking reception. And as a reminder, you're welcome to pick up the books from uh, by Alyssa and so many to your right. Thank you.